Woohoo! It's happening! All right. Hey everyone, it's me again, Brittany, and I'm here today to talk about Queen of Shadows. I'm so excited to talk about Queen of Shadows. I have a ton of thoughts and I feel like I noticed a lot more in this reread than I thought that I would and I feel like I have a lot of differing opinions than what I thought I would have so it's gonna be kind of fun and I'm trying not to make this video crazy long because I have to be at school or I have to be leaving for school in about 30 minutes so let's hope for the best right so for this non-spoilery section um obviously Throne of Glass follows Selena Sardothian an assassin as she journeys through Adderland and, you know, works for the king and kind of stuff like that. And if you haven't read any of it, that's really all I can tell you about it. Now, if you've read up to Air of Fire, let me give you a summary of Queen of Shadows. Uh, so basically in Queen of Shadows, Selena slash Aelin has made it back to Adderland and she is in hiding to stay away from the king and she has to kind of plan the way that she's going to take him down because obviously at this point she didn't complete her mission. She is going to be found out. As far as the actual writing, I found the beginning of this very slow. I actually wasn't really enjoying myself for the first like hundred or so pages and I... I don't know, some of the like switching between characters I found kind of unnecessary. There was just certain times where I was like, I don't know, it just didn't feel like I needed to see that many characters' point of views. And I wish that we had gotten into more characters' perspectives, like Nezrin, I feel like it would have been more interesting. And instead we kind of get this like vague idea that she's really cool and that's it. But other than that, I really love Manon's chapters. I'm pretty fond of Aelin's chapters. And I have so many thoughts on Kale because as you guys know, I I hate Kale for the most part and this book kind of has me feeling a little weird about that, about saying it like that. And yeah, that's kind of it for like my non-spoilery section. Let's just jump in. Oh, also I gave this book five stars. Uh, the ending really did it for me. The last 150 pages or so I was hooked and I remembered why this book had been such so high up in my list of the throne of glass books yeah let's get into the spoilery section so goodbye all of you who don't want to be spoiled or have not read queen of shadows so <laughs> let's start with kale because i feel like that is the thing that i went into this book determined to find out how it all went wrong because for the most part air fire leaves with kale on a pretty optimistic note um, Dorian has had his talks with him and Kale has kind of seen the ways that he was wrong about how he saw Selena and it just leaves optimistically and obviously you know Dorian gets trapped in a collar at the end of Air Fire and I guess that's kind of what destroys Kale's mood. <sighs> now on to that. I in a way I kind of want to say that Kale's mood swings don't make a lot of sense because the way that this book leaves off, again, is really optimistic, it's really hopeful, and the way that Tower of Dawn, from what I remember, starts is with a lot of hate from Kale to Selena. And it's just, it doesn't make a lot of sense, it's almost like maybe Sarah J Maas forgot that everything had been resolved and then she went back to like, it's just, I don't know, it's almost as if Kale can't grow because even when he grows, his personality just draws him back to his hatred towards things that he doesn't understand. It's just the weirdest situation because this book starts off and Kale, for the most part, is really excited to see Selena again when she appears in the sewers. But almost immediately he gets very cold and mean and he has these like very rude things to say about her trip to Wendelin. Like, he, you literally sent her off to Wendelin and now you're mad because she's back and she didn't bring reinforcements. You never told her to bring reinforcements. You expected her to stay in Wendelin for the rest of her life. It's just, it didn't make a lot of sense. And I, at one point I definitely thought that it was just the fact that this was Kale. Like this is how Kale had always been. In the beginning of Throne of Glass, he did not like Selena. He hated her. He hated her for being a criminal and for being a murderer and he just didn't want to see her point of view. So I thought maybe, okay, that's what it is. That's his core personality and everything else is just him trying to move past that. Which could totally be it. Maybe that is his core personality. Maybe he still definitely holds a grudge on her for being an assassin. Oh, this is the part where uh, Kale is kind of just being cruel towards Selena, even though he was really excited to see her at first. 
And he's saying, no, Selena Sardothian certainly did not exist anymore, blah, 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 blah. Or maybe he'd been a fool all this time, a fool to look at the lives she'd taken and blood she'd so irreverently spilled and not be disgusted. And so my little note in the book was, and the truth, he always hated what she was, he fell in love with his own lie. Which I think could definitely be possible. I think that he made out Selena to be something else. He was like, she's not just a murderer, she just murders because she has to, and I'm gonna look past it. And he just really ignored that part of her life. But she was a trained assassin, and not only was she, like, she did murder out of necessity, but in a way, Selena definitely enjoys murder and he just looked past that because he wanted to love her and he knew that that was something he could never get over so that was a big part where i think like his personality was getting in the way of everything where he was trying to build on his like he was trying to grow and that's what was holding him back is the fact that he fell in love with a lie and aelin <laughs> eggs him on so i realized in this reread that it's definitely both of them. It's the way that she responds to him and the way that he responds to her that causes a ton of miscommunication between the two characters and it's just, it's why they dislike each other so much in certain scenes. Aelin's also very, very mean to Kale in the very beginning because she blames him for Dorian's collaring because she obviously knows that once you're collared you're kind of done you're dead and so she's really mad at Kale for having left Dorian during that time she was like I never would have ran away I would have stayed there and saved Dorian and maybe she would have but the thing is is Dorian did tell Kale to run and Kale didn't want to run and he had no idea that that black collar would have been put on him and I think it's kind of unfair because I don't think Aelin would have been able to pass up the opportunity to run either because she wouldn't have really known if she hadn't gone to Wendelin She wouldn't have known that the black collars were a thing So she would have probably Assumed that Dorian could definitely stand up to his father that his father needed an heir like I I don't, I don't think it's fair the way that she's judging him And I definitely don't think it's fair the way that he judges her in the end though Everything is kind of working out. He's really seeing like Aelin's a queen. He, she's gonna be a good queen to her people. He, her, he and her like make an agreement to kill Dorian, and then when that doesn't work out, they or when they realize that Dorian's still in there, they make an agreement to free Dorian. They're on the same team, and they're very much in the same mindset. So it was very confusing to me because at the end of the book, he's not even mad at her. Like not, she leaves, and she leaves a. a Rose burning on his nightstand like they leave on very good terms in a way and I don't know what happens in between that and Tower of Dawn I'm very very curious to see my thoughts on Tower of Dawn because maybe I had just been too separated from Queen of Shadows to notice like what was going on maybe I wasn't paying enough attention all of that's very possible but overall end of Queen of Shadows I don't hate Kale I, I used to hate him a lot I still think he's very annoying very frustrating and just kind of like a dumb macho man like he just always wants to be right and doesn't really care about seeing other people's sides of things and it's annoying that Dorian is like his only source of reason but uh, anyways but in the, at the very end of Queen of Shadows I didn't hate Kale. What else? So Nezrin. I think Nezrin's a very interesting addition to this because right off the bat Aelin actually really likes Nezrin and I thought that was kind of hilarious because I remember when I first read Queen of Shadows and Nezrin was introduced I did not like Nezrin. Um, but Aelin likes her right off the bat and obviously Kale likes her and I think that she should have gotten more time in the book because we're seeing all these like characters grow attached to her but we're not really seeing much of why they're growing attached to her they're they're attached to her because she's a solid steady rock or because her father makes good pastries or maybe it's because she's really good with an arrow i just it was very weird to like see all the other characters like falling in love with her just like as a friend and and Kale as, you know, more than a friend and not really having an explanation. Like, yeah, she seems really cool, and but we don't get really anything about Nezrin until Tower of Dawn, so it's just... I don't know, I feel like she should have gotten a little bit more time in the book. I actually really want to talk about Caltaine. I have so many weird crackpot theories about it because I'm very confused. Okay, so in the first book, I remember I talked in my book talk that there's a line that Cal Caltaine says, if only my mother could see me now. I wish I knew who she was and she says that she's talking about Selena when she says I knew I wish I knew who she was but we never really get anything more on Caltaine's mom like she's just this dead person that never gets spoken about or anything like that and I'm starting to think that Caltaine has to be related to either Dorian 
or Selena, like either of them. I'm not sure who, but I feel like she has to be. Like it could be Dorian because obviously Dorian has like raw magic and I have a weird theory that maybe uh, Dorian's mom isn't his mom and because he has these like really blue eyes that neither of his parents actually I don't think they talk about either of them having them. So I have a theory that his mom is like this other like powerful person. And so in that case, it could have been like Caltain's mother as well. Or it's somehow related to Aelin. And obviously I'm thinking she's related to Aelin because she has shadow fire. But it doesn't start as shadow fire. She says it very clearly that when the demon took over her and, and she had the stone put into her arm, that that's when the, the golden fire that she had had as a child got warped into shadow fire. And it's just, I, that's way too much of a coincidence. Like, you're gonna tell me that golden fire, like, and she has a lot of it. She had a lot of power. She burnt down, like, half of Morath, or well, a third. So she has a ton of power. She has a lot of wildfire in her, in her veins, or fire, but I don't think there's a difference between wildfire and fire. So I'm very, very curious. I don't think she's dead. Like, I understand, I totally get it, she burnt herself to ash, and there's only darkness, but I don't think she's done. Like, I don't think her story's done. It doesn't make any... There's, there's just way too many connections. Like, are you gonna really tell me that Sarah J Maas, the queen of dropping hints in her books, is gonna drop all these hints about Caltain, about her fire, about her mother, and just let her die? That's it? I don't think so. I think that... She might have died. Okay, she she might have. But she I think she's going to still have to come back in Kingdom of Ash or something like that. I'm it's just unresolved. Like we never got the answer. Why did she have fire in her veins? How did that happen? I there's just so many questions. And also, I love that Caltain ate the demon inside her. Piece by little piece, she was just kind of like goblin at him, which is just the weirdest like mindset. I actually kind of really like how they how Sarah J Maas portrays the people being in their mind while the demon's taking over their body. And I just, I think it's hilarious that Caltain was that vicious, that she was able to kill the demon inside her and, or the prince. And yeah, that was, that was a really entertaining part. I just think that she's way too powerful to like not have more story. And she ends up being good and she does give or she sends Selena the rock, which is so crazy. The word stone or the, the gate key, whatever. Word key. Um, I just, I don't know. I don't think her story is done. The more I read it, the more I'm convinced that it's not. Also, I think it's really sad that uh, at certain points, Aelin, when she's hanging out with Lysandra, thinks about that. Like, what if she had given another apparently snooty girl a chance and been her friend would things have turned out differently and I think they would have. I think that if Caltain comes back her and Aelin would be friends. I just don't know how she'll come back but I really feel like she will so who knows. Um so on to Manon. I think her story of this one is actually pretty interesting because she's definitely fighting with herself. She has a lot of responsibility on her shoulders and she can't go against what her grandmother wants her to do. And her grandmother is wanting her to agree with Duke Parrington to let these witches be tested on where witchlings are the most important thing in in a witch's life. And I think it's just so weird that she doesn't turn against her grandma. I think it's so weird that her grandma is letting all this happen. Like, what is she actually promised? Because I know they're technically promised the Witchlands or, you know, that area. But I don't think that has to be it because obviously her grandmother is in on all the plans. She's in on having weird demon Witchlings. She's in on how to destroy the kingdom. She, she wants everything to go this way and she doesn't care about the Covens and I just... I think that there has to be something deeper there that the they're maybe like promising her more power or something. I'm not sure. Also, <laughs> I think it's great that Caltain isn't there so that they can use the Shadowfire towers. Um, what else are you gonna do with those mirror towers? Like, I don't think they can do anything else with those mirror towers, but then again, they probably will just have some weird Val Prince demon thing to control it and then it's gonna really be bad. 
Um, but yeah, Manon is having like a lot of internal conflict in this one and obviously Astrin is trying to push her. Astrin wants her to be good and she saw like that she could be in the last book. So Astrin's really trying to like force that on her and make her realize that she's only bad because she was raised bad. My boyfriend's calling. Love seeing Manon try and grow in this one. Obviously like she keeps like tearing down Astrin and I thought it was kind of frustrating. Her whole coven is like trying to turn her against her grandma or trying to just say no to Duke, but like she can't say no to them. Like she doesn't, like they don't realize all the responsibility that's on her shoulder, which is kind of frustrating because like they're supposed to be completely like have her back and everything. And instead they're constantly questioning her, which must be super, super frustrating. Um, and then obviously, okay, wait, I love the scene where <laughs> Manon meets Aelin uh, because she sees this queen and I loved seeing Aelin and her group from another perspective. It was just so different and Aelin's fidgeting and doing all this stuff and then in the fight where Manon's about to die and you hear Astrid screaming and Aelin obviously saves Manon because she and they ask her and I thought that that was actually like a really good point in the story because she felt like a weird connection that she couldn't explain and she had to save Manon and obviously Manon is going to come into play later on in the books so I just thought it was such a good like point in the story where she saves Manon where Manon has this life debt where now <laughs> I just also think it's funny that the reason Aelin says is like I can't let someone that fights that good die that way and it's not because of that there's just some other connection going on because Manon and Aelin are such similar characters and both very hard-headed both in the lead, but I feel like Manon has just like had a lot more time to hone this badass lady and Astrid screaming her name and that's why Aelin saves her because she was like, that's how I screamed your name to Rowan. And I, I don't, that was like a nice side of Aelin's humanity because we don't get to see that a lot in her. We don't get to see her good side. She always has to make the hard decisions. And in this one, she let that good side win and I thought that that was a really nice touch. Oh, this is the scene where um, Aelin saves her and one of the lines is, but perhaps the monsters needed to look out for each other every now and then. And I like that. Obviously then Manon has a debt owed to her. And I forgot that it was that she told her that Dorian was still in there, which I, love the scene with Dorian. Oh my god, I was dying. Well, first it all starts with, um, Hello Princeling, which is, I love it. Which actually I'm pretty sure that Aelin says Hello Princeling to Dorian in the first book, but I'm not 100% sure, but I think she does. Like, listen to this. Let this be another dream, another nightmare. Let this new lovely monster devour him whole. Do I need a reason to smile at a beautiful woman? I'm not a woman, and you, she sniffed, man or demon, prince. And then he cocked his head, I've never been with a witch. <laughs> oh my gosh, and it's just so hilarious. I think not prince, but would you bleed red or black? I'll bleed whatever color you tell me to. Like, I don't know how that's so sexy, but it totally is. Do you want me to kill you, Dorian? I want you to do lots of things to me. <laughs> I'm so dead. Come find me again, Prince, and we'll see about that. I was never like a fan of the Dorian and Manon train, but after reading that scene, I was like, you know what? Actually, I might be here for it, so <laughs> I'm not sure. Either way, it was hilarious. I guess there isn't much else to talk about. I guess Erevin, that whole scene, it was a long time in coming. I love that Aelin was going to the bank and tricking the master and everything so that she could get the money in the end. Um, I like that she let Lysandra do it. I love, oh, that's what I want to talk about. I love Lysandra and Aelin's friendship throughout this. Like she needed that. Aelin definitely needed a girlfriend after Nehemia dies. And it's, it's just really nice, especially cause she ends up being a shapeshifter. And I love that Aelin doesn't let that like get in the way of them because that was kind of a big spot of concern was that she thought Lysandra was worried that because she had lied to her that Aelin wouldn't want to be her friend anymore. And Aelin did have that momentary struggle where she's like, do I want to be friends with someone that lies to me? Is this going to be exactly like Nehemia? And instead she like lets it sink in, realizes that Nehemia lied for a reason and that Lysandra had to lie for this. And it, I, that was a good moment of character growth for Aelin and she lets Lysandra in and I love 
just how pure Lysandra ends up being, how like good of a person and how loyal and then she gets kidnapped and obviously that's that whole scene and then when they save her and everything's fine and and then the end. Okay, let's just talk about the end. I think that's really all I want to touch on after this because Rowaylin, for whatever reason, wasn't doing it for me in this book. I, I have no idea why. It just wasn't like... I mean, it was cool. It was fine. But at the end of the day, I was kind of just like not as invested. I don't know if maybe it'll change in Empire of Storms, but I don't know why, but I really just wasn't that into Rowan in this book, which was so weird because I loved it the first time I read it. But, um, the ending. I love that Lysandra ends up running across the streets and then when the tower is broken and she shifts into a snow leopard to save everyone, that part is incredible. Also, hilarious when she is throwing up in Aelin's room when Lorcan tries to come in and it's Lorcan, right? Yeah, and he tries to come in and like talk to Aelin and Lysandra's standing there trying, trying to stop it and then she just starts throwing up on him. I thought it was so funny <laughs> but what else kale he ends up being a good person in the end i thought that that was a really cool touch was when they're talking about the eye of lena and that it only works for those who are brave of heart and kale had never been brave of heart that's why it had never glowed for him which was like totally a diss on his part but when he decided to die to save dorian that made him brave of heart and it was able to work for him and it saved him for most of the king's power but you know now he can't walk and i feel like that might be where his bitterness comes from towards selena but i just don't think it would be i'm still very confused as to like what's going on in tower of dawn um and the king i thought that was so interesting okay the king had been taken over a long time ago and he was really kind of led into that situation by Duke Parrington. Like, Parrington is the one that's actually in control. The king is just another puppet. And he'd been trying to save Dorian this entire time. He had blocked magic to try and save Dorian. They had killed the healers, which I think comes into play in Tower of Dawn for another reason. They just, everything had happened for an exact reason, and I love that. It wasn't just the king being cruel. It was the king trying to save his family, and then the, the demon thing and him being very cruel. So, also, uh, I don't know if I believe it. I just, like, I, I'm very mm, about it because I don't know if he really did go to see Aelin that day when she was still a little kid to try and get him, her to burn him alive. Like, I know that's what he said, that he had tried to put that into her head so that she could try to burn him, but I feel like there would have been a more direct way to get her to attack him, and I just don't think he did it very well. And it's a very large bummer that him going to her to try to save himself kills her entire family. Like, I don't, I don't really care about that excuse that you just made, because either way, Aelin's family ends up dead, so it's kind of crazy. I think it's kind of sad that Dorian doesn't believe his dad because in a way that was like his dad redeeming himself for everything that had gone wrong. Like not completely, but it, for the most part he had been trying to try and save Dorian and things like that. And Dorian kills him, so wow! Also, I'm confused. I, I know that they touch on it in the end where you can combine with raw magic. I just don't think that's very fair because supposedly you're only supposed to be able to combine magic with your Cal and Mai, like just like how Rowan and Aelin are. So I thought it was so weird that she just knew that if she went into Dorian's power, she would just be able to join powers with him. And I think that it is weird that it's even a possibility. So back to when magic was released, I love everyone's different points of view when it's happening. Like when it's actually happening, the world shook and like every, and then, uh, we move on to Manon, and it says the mortal human weight vanished, strength coursed through her, coating her bones like armor, invincible, immortal, unstoppable. Manon tipped her head back to the sky, spread her arms wide, and roared. And then the keep was in chaos, magic, magic was free, not possible. And oh, this is Caltaine. The loosing of some great beast inside her, a beast who purred at the shadow fire. And it was just incredible. Like, I love that entire scene of everyone. I, I like the way that the ending was written, just like switching between different points of view for impact. It was just, I felt that the impact was really well done. Um, I can't remember what I was talking about anymore. <laughs> also, going back to Lysandra and Aelin's friendship, when Aelin gives Lysandra a territory, like, 
Also, when she pays off her debts to the madam, I think that was already incredible. And then when she gives her territory, and I thought it, the whole scene was kind of funny because you just see um, Aelin giving her a box, and Lysander goes, proposing to me, how unexpected. And when she opens it up and it is a ring, she goes, are you proposing to me, Aelin Galathinius? And I thought that that was hilarious. Um, and it was just really touching because it's like you could tell that until that moment, Lysandra was loyal to Aelin. She definitely felt the friendship, but she was never sure if she could be loved in the same way. Like, she's still so scarred from everything that happened to her. And I thought that that was a very important scene to have because she definitely deserves love. She's definitely a really good person. She definitely deserves to have a good life after everything that she's done and had to do. So I just, I really enjoyed that. And I loved seeing another little bit of Aelin's just generosity and her like true good heart. And it was just, it was just so nice. All right, the last thing I do want to talk about is just Astrin's story to Manon. I think that that was the real, obviously that was the actual point of change where Manon realized that she wanted to be good, that they would made her bad, that she needed to stand for something. And I thought that that whole story was so sad. And I, I'm very curious to know if the baby really had been dead. I, I mean, I know that it probably was, but I, I always have that little inkling in me that I'm like, what if it hadn't been? And the matron was just that freaking mean that she burned a baby alive. I don't know. I, I just like, I feel like it's not true, but at the same time, I feel like it might be. And I think it's BS that she like carved that into her stomach. And I think it's sad that Astrid felt like she needed to keep it from Manon for all those years. Like Manon is her second. And even though, I guess, okay, the thing is, is Manon does grow a lot in the past two books. Like she goes from a very cold hearted, rule following person to a thinking machine that actually loves her friends. So I guess she couldn't have told her before this point, but I think it was, it, it was just that whole story was crazy. And then you see at the very end where Manon is like talking to Astrin and she goes, what was it like, Manon asked quietly, to love? For love was what it had been, what Astrin perhaps alone of all the Iron Teeth witches had felt, had learned. And you just see Manon say, things are changing. And Astrin responds with, good, we're mortals, things should change, and often, or they'll get boring. And I just, I really love that scene because things should, uh, I don't know. I think that was really important. I really love Manon. I love her so much and my love for her keeps growing. I think that sh her chapters were actually my favorite in this one. And maybe I was putting Aelin on a back burner. Maybe that's why I wasn't that interested in Rowan because like we have, yeah, okay, whatever. Aelin and Rowan as a love thing was kind of fun. Hi, T'Challa. <laughs> but it was actually way more fun to watch Manon have her friendships and that's it like have her love for her animal and her friends and not have a la love interest and be that badass maybe that's why i loved her so much in this one i just feel like maybe in this in this particular book rowan didn't need to be there i, I feel weird saying that because i love him so much but that's actually kind of how it feels in the end. Like, there's just a lot of scenes where I felt were unnecessary. Or maybe he could have still been a friend and it could have evolved later. I just felt it was kind of like a very sudden change. Um, which I hadn't noticed in my first round, but definitely in the second round I did. So, yeah, that's kind of it. That's all I want to talk about. I feel like there's definitely a lot of things that I'm missing. And I've, I feel like this was all over the place. But I hope you... Ow, you're pulling on my hair. Don't pull on it. <laughs> He likes to chew on my hair. Um, but I hope you guys still enjoyed. Let me know what your thoughts are. Let me know if I'm not totally crazy and feeling like maybe Rowan could have just stayed a friend for this whole book and then later on been, you know, evolved or something like that. I think, I do think that scenes with him and Aelin were funny. I wasn't completely against it. Just for whatever reason, it didn't uh, bring the same like love feelings that I had the first time reading the books. I'm not sure. Um, so yeah, let me know. If I missed anything, if there were any scenes that you wanted to see me discuss, I will definitely discuss them with you in the comments down below. And yeah, I make videos Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays most of the time, and I will see you in my next one. Bye!